Here we are, in the future. I have a supercomputer in my pocket containing a library of all human knowledge. It's also a video phone. Robots are vacuuming our floors and taking our jobs. Our system of government has largely become a reality TV show, complete with a television personality as commander-in-chief. The future is here, and it's everything we dreamed it would be. Except one thing is amiss. Our skies are conspicuously empty of flying cars. They've been a staple of sci-fi for almost as long as the genre has existed, and we've had cars and airplanes for over a hundred years now, so there's no engineering hurdle that prevents us from making a flying car. In fact, flying cars exist. They were made almost as soon as we were able to slap a couple of wings on a lawnmower engine. But no flying car has ever reached production status. So what happened? Everyone wants a flying car, right? Well, if the fantastic future of flying cars had come to pass, our world might be less a Jetsons-esque utopia free of traffic jams and more of a never-ending nightmare of deafening noise, vehicular carnage, and environmental catastrophe. Anyway, here's how we avoided the horror of flying cars so far. Arguably, the first flying car was developed by Mr. Model T himself, Henry Ford. Just over a decade after he introduced the assembly line to his manufacturing plants and made the automobile an inescapable feature of the American landscape, Ford set about doing the same thing with the airplane. Needless to say, he didn't have much success. This was in 1926. The Wright brothers had successfully attached wings to a lawnmower engine just two decades earlier, and commercial air travel was still a fledgling industry. Henry Ford's prototype was called the Ford Fliver. It was basically a single-seat airplane, but intended for the average American. The Ford Motor Company took it on publicity tours of the country and touted it as the Model T of the air. But the Fliver never made it past test flights. In 1928, a prototype crashed into the Atlantic Ocean, killing the pilot. But that didn't stop the Ford Motor Company from trying again. In 1931, another personal flying vehicle was developed, called the Stout Sky Car. It was designed to be as easy to operate as Ford's automobiles and just as affordable. But the Sky Car's timing could have been better. The United States was deep in the Great Depression. People didn't have the money to spend on a personal airplane. So the Sky Car never made it to the assembly line. The Ford Motor Company continued to tinker with flying cars into the 40s and 50s, but nothing ever progressed beyond scale models and concept drawings. But Ford wasn't the only guy trying to make a flying car. In 1949, aeronautical engineer Molt Taylor designed and constructed the Aero Car. Unlike the Fliver and Sky Car, the Taylor Aero Car was an actual combination automobile and airplane, able to drive on roads as well as fly. Taylor accomplished this by making the Aero Car a transformer. It could convert from flying to driving by folding up the wings and detaching the propeller. The Aero Car was granted civil certification in 1956, but Taylor could not round up enough interested buyers to warrant mass production. So only six aero cars were ever built. At around the same time, the US military became interested in developing a flying jeep. Instead of using wings and propellers like previous flying cars, these were duct-based vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. The Piyazeki VZ-8 Air Jeep was one of the more successful prototypes developed. Looking much like a giant hoverboard, it was designed for low-altitude flight as to avoid radar detection. It first flew in 1959, and the military tested several models over the next few years, but ultimately decided to scrap the project and focus on conventional helicopters. Although they continued to soar in the public consciousness, flying cars were never able to get up off the ground in reality, so to speak. And let's thank our lucky stars they never did, because people would hate flying cars. Now, as we know, flying is one of the safest ways to travel, but that's mainly because our commercial passenger jets are meticulously maintained by a fleet of mechanics and ground crew. We couldn't expect the same level of care and oversight from the private owner of a personal flying car. Another reason commercial flight is so safe is that every plane is flown by well-trained pilots with years of education and experience. Flying cars? Not so much. A consumer-level flying car has to be easy enough to operate that virtually anyone can get behind the steering wheel slash flight stick. That means a whole lot of regular people without the training or skills of a licensed pilot will be responsible for safely flying a small, fast-moving airborne projectile. Right now, there are 6 million automobile accidents every year in the US. Now imagine if those accidents happened hundreds of feet in the air. Relatively benign fender benders would have become lethal mid-air collisions. In a world of flying cars, flying the friendly skies would be a statistical bloodbath. Safety aside, 
Flying cars would be extremely noisy. A Bell J2A helicopter puts out about 100 decibels. Now multiply that by the number of cars on the road, and you get an inkling of just how loud the traffic noise would be if everyone was zipping around in flying cars. Living in a city would be like living under the flight path of the busiest airport in the world, and the airplanes would be landing in your street. And all that noise would be coming from the propellers or ducted fans keeping all those cars airborne. Those engines burn a lot of fuel. Commercial jets are by and large more fuel efficient per passenger than the average car. That's largely because passenger jets are able to cram a lot of people inside of them. The occupancy of a personal flying car would be more like that of a typical automobile, which is on average 1.38 people, just over one person, for an entire trip. So its fuel efficiency would be drastically reduced. Helicopters often burn more fuel per mile than a semi-truck. Airplanes can approach and exceed the fuel economy of a sedan-sized car, but only if they're cruising at an optimal altitude and a constant speed over a long distance. If we're using our flying cars in any way like our normal ground cars, we'd be going for a lot of short trips to work, or the store, or an 80s-themed cafe. That makes them even less fuel efficient. So any owner of a flying car would be spending a lot of money on fuel. The expense alone might be enough to keep flying cars out of the hands of most of the population. But even if your pocketbook could withstand the costs of burning all that fossil fuel, the environment might not. Let's imagine an alternate universe. One where our fantastic flying car future had come to fruition. Let's say Molt Taylor was able to find enough customers to put his aero car into production in the late 50s. Through healthy competition and several end-of-the-year sales events, flying cars have become as much a fixture of our society as cars are now. That entire time, our skies were not only filled with the technical majesty of flying cars, but the resultant CO2 emissions. If you think global warming is a problem now, in a world where everybody's flying a fossil fuel burning car to get around, it would be an unmitigated disaster. For society and the planet, flying cars may be the best thing that never happened. But that doesn't mean they won't ever happen. Several companies, including Rolls-Royce, Toyota, Volvo, and Google co-founder Larry Page, are all investing in the next generation of flying cars. These new designs eliminate some of the problems with older flying cars. Gas engines have been replaced with cleaner, quieter battery power, and much of the flying has been taken out of the hands of us fallible humans and entrusted to GPS satellites and somewhat less fallible AI software. Ride-sharing company Uber is even planning on the introduction of flying taxis to its fleet in Dubai and Dallas, Texas by 2020. Whether these flying cars will be more than just luxury, people-sized drones that cater only to the super wealthy remains to be seen. So for now, we'll just have to be content with the boring, flightless future we have. Special thanks to our Patreon patrons. Without their support, the good stuff just wouldn't happen. So if you like what we do here, go on over to patreon.com slash the good stuff and become a supporter. And thanks for watching. My new game is Trump the game. Trump the game.